Hello, everybody, and welcome um, to our Queensland SIPS webinar. We'll just give it a few minutes while we let everybody into the webinar, and then we will uh, kick off. So if you'd like to let us know where you're joining us from today, we've got a lot of people, not just from Australia, but also from overseas, just pop in the chat um, where you're from. I'm based in um, Brisbane and it is a beautiful sunny hot day outside. You can see the beautiful blue sky from the background there. Hi Cecilia, we've got oh lots of people. Perth, New Zealand, welcome everybody. One of the beauties of doing webinars and our pivot to um, online uh, webinars rather than face-to-face -face events is being able to get lots of people from across Australia and the world involved. So welcome. Oh, hi, Darren. Great to see it sunny in Adelaide. Hi, Nathan. Great to um, see you online. So good to see lots of um, university folk online. Fantastic. So it just takes a few minutes, as everybody knows, to let everybody in. So for those that have just joined us, pop in the chat where you're from. We're really keen to hear where everybody is from today because we've got lots of um, different locations. A lot of people from Perth. It's a bit early over in Perth at the moment, so welcome. Welcome, Chris, from Kelvin Grove. Lots of people from um, New Zealand, it's great. Fantastic, really looking forward um, to having everybody on the call today and really um, excited as part of um, Indigenous Business Month to be holding this. Um, so I'd like to, um, we're gonna kick off now, which is great. So I'd like to um, advise everyone that the webinar is currently being recorded and we will make it available um, to all attendees next week. So you'll get that in an email. Um, I would like to firstly kick off by really acknowledging um, the Tirubal and Yagara people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I present from today in Kelvin Grove in Brisbane. We pay respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. We have over 170 uh, registered attendees today, which is fantastic. So welcome everybody. And as you can see from the chat from across Australia and New Zealand. For those of you that don't know, just a little bit about SIPS. So SIPS is the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. It's your global professional body for procurement and supply professionals, dedicated to promoting best practice, continuous improvement in professional standards, and raising awareness of the contribution that procurement and supply management can make to organisations. And this example, you know, is through this webinar is one example of how we're really trying to do that. Before we get started, some Zoom um, housekeeping, which I'm sure everybody is very familiar with. Everybody will be uh, muted during the presentations. However, you can use the chat box to write comments um, you've got. You can share it with all the panelists or all attendees, or you can select individual people um, on the call. If you have any specific questions that you'd like answered from anybody um, on the panel today, please feel free to put them in the question and answer box rather than the chat. Um, we will have time at the end to answer any questions that you've got. And if we do run over and don't um, have time, we will source answers for you and come back to you. So fantastic. So really a massive thank you for joining um, this event. Um, we've put this on um, with QUT and also with the Queensland um, SIPS branch. Um, and really the purpose of today is to hear firsthand how buying goods and services from Indigenous businesses can not only create diverse supply chains that are more sustainable, flexible and innovative, but can really stimulate Indigenous entrepreneurship, business and economic development. And we'll hear more about that today. I'd like to firstly introduce our fantastic host and a massive thank you for her for joining us today, um, Lisa Watergo. So Lisa founded the Indigenous Business Networking Friday uh, Coffee Morning event back in 2014 um, as a volunteer member of the Southeast Queensland Indigenous Chamber of Commerce. 
This has now transitioned into Black Coffee, a nationwide initiative in conjunction with Townsville and Regional Indigenous Business Network. In 2018, Lisa was appointed as the Queensland Government's Procurement Industry Advisory Group, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Champion, and is the co-founder of Black Coffee and Indigenous Business Month. Um, Lisa is, a, is really passionate about the development of Indigenous businesses and the Indigenous Chamber of Commerce movement. And we're really lucky to have her on board today. Thanks, Lisa, for hosting. I'll now hand over to you. Thank you so much, Tivoli. It's lovely to be here and I'm very honoured to be hosting um, this session today. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the unceded sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples from across this continent. I'm coming to you today from Mianjin, um, the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people. And I noticed in the chat, I was looking in the chat and a few people have indicated on whose country they are on. And so I invite you again to say, um, to, to uh, acknowledge the country that you're coming from as well. So thanks so much, um, Tivoli. It's, and thank you to everybody in the SIPS family uh, for having us here today. Um, yes, it is Indigenous Business Month and this year's theme is powering the Indigenous economy. Um, it's the seventh year that we've had Indigenous Business Month and I'm very proud to be one of the co-founders. Um, and really for us, um, this year keeps getting better and better. Um, we have gotten through, I don't know if we've gotten through, but we are, you know, dealing with pandemics and how do we have a, a month that showcases Indigenous business when we actually can't all get together. And it's been a fantastic two years, particularly um, to see the continued growth of Indigenous businesses. So today's session, um, embedding Indigenous procurement within your organisations and your supply chains is a fantastic topic and it's incredibly timely. Um, we're going to do this session into, in three parts. So the first part we're going to hear from Lucy Garrity from uh, Supply Nation. We're going to hear from Karen Siege from Snap Underwood and we're going to hear from Joey Wallace from Multhana. Then we're going to have a bit of a, I'm going to ask a few questions and then I'm going to invite questions from the floor. So um, sit back it's going to be i'm really excited that we're going to be hearing from indigenous businesses and also uh, supply nation and um i'll talk to you shortly lucy thanks so much lisa and thanks everyone for having me here today i'm also on yagara turable country up here in mianjin uh, but thank you for letting me have a quick chat about supply nation and supplier diversity uh, so Supply Nation is part of the Global Supplier Diversity Alliance, which is the countries China, the UK, the US, Canada, South Africa, and in Australia, it is called Supply Nation. The crux of what we do is verification of Indigenous businesses. Uh, so we adopt the same process that all of the Global Supplier Diversity Alliance does. And one of the reasons that, uh, that, biz, uh, that Supply Nation came into place in Australia was working with the federal government to uh, embed the Indigenous procurement policy, which was introduced in 2015. So uh, the federal government spend here in Australia before that time was about $6.2 million a year. And since 2015, they have spent over $3 billion. So it's a great outcome and Indigenous businesses thriving here in Australia. Uh, Supply Nation grows its database by about 30% year on year, which is fantastic. Uh, one thing to note is that in other countries that are part of the Global Supplier Diversity Alliance, it is many different minorities. And here in Australia, it is just our Australian Indigenous people. The reason for that is uh, that there is a gap that exists. Uh, I'm not sure if participants from other countries have heard about Australia's work in trying to close the gap, but uh, it's basically looking at the different markers of how Indigenous people are uh, treated badly here and trying to uh, support Indigenous people in having the same outcomes that non-Indigenous people do. So uh, that is why we focus on Australian Indigenous people here. Uh, and 
Yeah, so since the federal government introduced that policy, every state government around Australia has also uh, introduced a similar amount, 3%. And the reason for it being 3% is that that is approximately the percentage of Indigenous people in Australia. So it's about trying to uh, basically fairly distribute uh, economic empowerment for Indigenous people. And uh, it's the great thing about it is that it's really working. Uh, we have such fantastic Indigenous businesses here in Australia. Uh, you know, the ingenuity and the entrepreneurship that they show is really inspiring. And so it is great that that is that that is increasing here in Australia. So that's a bit of what Supply Nation does. We have about uh, three and a half thousand businesses on our database, which is called the Indigenous Business Directory. Uh, and that is a public facing search engine. So if anyone from a different country were to want to procure from an Indigenous Australian business, you can do that by popping on to the Supply Nation website, which is supplynation.org.au. And you can search for and find uh, an Australian Indigenous business. Uh, if that was something that you wanted to do, and of course, in this era, uh, there are lots of businesses where it doesn't have to be local. It could be a product uh, that can be shipped. It could be consulting. So there's a lot of possibility for remote work, uh, which is great. And what Supply Nation also does is basically helps corporations and government to find Indigenous suppliers. So we have a couple of different online tools that we use for that. Uh, we've got an online notice board where members can post different opportunities that they might have. Uh, it could be an RFQ, it could be an EOI, and that is a way just to connect the Indigenous suppliers with people who are looking to procure. So there are some really great online tools that we have. Uh, and yeah, the, I think the great thing about the Indigenous procurement policy here is that it is really working in every corporation as well as government is taking it up as well, because it can't just be government. It has to be all corporates and government, basically. Uh, so that's a little bit about Supply Nation. Uh, I will hand over to Karen now, but if you have any questions about Supply Nation, it would be lovely if you popped them in the chat or you could ask them at the end. Thanks so much. Over to you, Karen. Thanks, Lucy. My name's Karen Siege. I'm a Noonaka woman from Minjeriba, that's Stradbroke Island. Um, I'm also the proud owner of Snap Underwood. I've been working in the um, printing and design industry for 35 years. The last 17 I spent with Snap, it's a franchise here at, in New Zealand as well as Australia. Um, I bought my own franchise 10 years ago this year. Uh, with the intent that I would always make it an Indigenous business. There wasn't one in Queensland at the time. Uh, so I basically went through the stages of there was not one Indigenous business on our books, that nothing at all. And I thought, well, what do I do to build this, to turn it into my passion, my dream? So I first got onto Supply Nation. Um, that was the starting point, and they've just been fantastic helping build my business. I then just networked just continuously. Every time there was a function on, I would go, I'd make myself available. I'd met, I met with all the elders in Logan, my area where my store is. Uh, and I just, I gradually changed, changed the way it wasn't wasn't like a normal print shop where you could just walk in, you order your business cards and letterheads. I wanted more out of it. I wanted to make it a comfortable place for Indigenous people that were wanting to start their own business 
and a, a safe place for them to come and yarn about how they wanted to grow their business. Probably, it took probably three years to really see the changes happening. I employed Indigenous people to come on board, um, women, it, women that um, had no idea on printing, so I put them through traineeships. Uh, I built them, they were also um, single mums with children, a few of them, and they then... Um, got off Centrelink, you know, had a full-time job, they could afford to buy a new car. So just these little things that we were doing that was giving this centre more soul than just a, a normal print shop. So um, I happened to be at a Queensland government networking function where I met um, Duncan Kerslake. Um, he, he was um, doing the procurement for the Commonwealth Games. Uh, this was back in 2016. He, uh, it was the first late Thursday afternoon and he gave me this really rushed job and said, I've got to have it on the desk. You know, it was printed manuals and I have to have them on the desk at nine o'clock. So myself and two of my staff stayed, we printed all night. I got the job into the city at quarter to nine on that Friday morning. And that started my journey then with Queensland government and doing um, printing for the Commonwealth Games. So that started in 2016 and the games were in 2018. We continued to print right up until then. We printed for another two years after that. So it was 2020 when I did my last job for the Commonwealth Games. In doing that, that then allowed, our sales went up. It was just incredible. We hired two more staff. We bought a lot more equipment. It gave me the ability to have more cash flow so I could spend money on new equipment, which meant that we could do more in-house rather than sending it, farming it out to other companies to print for us. We could do it all ourselves. It meant more staff, more hours for the staff that I have. Um, and and we've, just, we've just grown since then. So the thought of the Olympic Games coming on board, and, and, and I know um, that the procurement starts way before the actual, the Games start. So it's just, it's really great to think that, yeah, you know, there's going to be so many opportunities out there for Indigenous businesses. Um, to also, because people are changing, procurement's changing, people are wanting to work with Indigenous businesses. I have my database now is 98% Indigenous businesses or big corporates that want to deal and support an Indigenous business. I contract out, um, I contract a lot of Indigenous artists who do paintings, which we put use then through all of our artwork or all of our design work. Um, so, so we're not just employing, we're contracting as well. And this is all because I've grown the business and not just me, but my team have grown the business. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my story. Um, very proud of the business and how it's grown. Uh, and just I'm really looking forward to the, the Olympic Games coming up. So I'll hand over to um, Joe now. Thanks, everybody. It looks like Joe, it's Lisa here. It looks like Joe may be having a little bit of trouble coming off mute. Joe, do you want to just. Okay, so it looks like Joe has unfortunately just disappeared. He will be coming back in. There we go. We've got him. I'm going off again. Well done, Joe. <laughs> Hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Wallace, uh, Managing Director of uh, Malthana Property Services. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owner groups on the country uh, on the Gold Coast, which is uh, the Yukonbi I'm of. Uh, I'm a proud uh, Juru, uh, durable uh, rainforest man from far north Queensland, um, up in um, the Tablelands. 
we go to the next slide. So about Molthana, uh, Molthana is an Indigenous business that we set up uh, back in uh, 2017. Um, we looked at employment and training opportunities for uh, First Nations people uh, in the really uh, basic level of entry of employment and the commercial cleaning, uh, landscaping and building maintenance. So Molthana is the Kalkanoon language, uh, which means coming together to help each other. Next slide. Um, our mission is to create um, an economics, sustainability and career development opportunities for First Nations people. So we've, we've partnered and I've looked at um, organisations that have reconciliation action plan, you know, work with other Indigenous um, networks, uh, providing traineeships in, to employees and looking at, you know, supporting the wider Indigenous community. Next slide. Um, how we fulfil our mission is like we provide, you know, commercial cleaning and landscaping, construction and maintenance. Um, so, you know, since our uh, 2017, um, we've worked really hard to, to work with a lot of tier one and tier two companies, uh, both state and federal and um, government contracts. Um, so, yeah, we was fortunate enough to, to win a contract, big contract with Brisbane City Council um, over two years ago. Next slide. So we have a monthly loser that goes out. So um, we set out 31% um, Indigenous um, employment um, that work with our company. Um, probably the last 12 to 16 months, we've really exploded um, with COVID. So we have a 200 uh, employees um, that there with the 32,458 hours. So that's Indigenous hours um, that's worked uh, per month of September. So how we calculate that is that when our staff members uh, join our, our company, there's a box that they tick if they're Indigenous. So we calculate the, the Indigenous hours um, that they work on our projects. Go to the next slide, thank you. So we do a lot of community participation within the community. So I like to give back to the community. So we, um, uh, we were finalists for Max Employment uh, 2021 last year. Um, we also uh, sponsor the um, Queen of Murray Carnival this year in Brisbane. Uh, also the Jets uh, net, netball uh, team for the, the Indigenous girls. Uh, also the Ipswich Jets out of Ipswich. Um, we work pretty closely with companies like JT Academy and Supply Oz in our supply chain. Next slide. So why we work with Indigenous businesses is to improve economics, sustainability for our local uh, communities. So I feel that you know, every time that we pick up a new contract, um, it, I look at employing more Indigenous staff members. Um, and, you know, we, we play our role and they also support us in terms of, you know, looking at the national closing the gap, you know, helping our mob in the community. Next slide. So there are affiliations that we've, we've worked with over the, the last four years, uh, which has been really great to our, supporting us. Next slide. So yeah, thank you for that. Thanks so much, Joe. That was awesome. And thank you, Karen and Lucy. So we, I think we are on time, which is fantastic. I can see a couple of questions are coming through. I just wanna, I was gonna ask um, Lucy, I wanna ask you a question. Um, and I, it's drawing on the question that um, somebody asked just before. One of the folks asked before, but so I, I just thought I might because because um, Karen's mentioned Supply Nation and you're from Supply Nation, and so just to kind of like you know corporations and organisations who are buyers become mem they're the members of Supply Nation, so they're the ones that pay the fees and and all that kind of stuff. So Karen is not a member of Supply Nation, but she's a registered registered or certified supplier so that's just kind of like the two sides of it um and so for those i think one of the things that i'm probably mo i've been thinking about that makes that i think is interesting is lucy what do you think are some of the um for your members who are the buyers what are some of the the key issues that they and this is also i think addressing matthew's question about 
um, how do we approach um, first, uh, like how do we do procurement? What are some of the biggest issues that your members experience when attempting to buy from suppliers? Like what, what uh, uh, and using Indigenous Business Direct, the directory, like what, what are some of the their pain points in terms of are there frustrations? Because, I mean, I'm interested as a small business owner, how, how can I go, okay, well, that's a pain point, I need to address that. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that often, and to be clear, you don't have to be a Supply Nation member to engage in supplier diversity. Uh, you can find Indigenous businesses on our directory or, you know, here in Queensland, we have a different directory called the Black Business Finder. Uh, but I think it's often that corporations don't really know how to get started. And sometimes I think it's been a bit difficult the past couple of years. Normally we host trade shows. Uh, and I think having that face-to-face -face contact is fantastic because sometimes people have fixed ideas of what an Indigenous business is. Uh, but now it is everything. And I sometimes think that they go into it and they don't understand how high level some of the businesses are, you know, uh, that there's a PricewaterhouseCoopers that's Indigenous owned, there are law firms. Uh, so I think that that is an important first step to help companies understand how high level the Indigenous businesses are. And yeah, when we have the trade shows, that's sort of immediately obvious. Mm. Uh, but you know, in the current era, it's about communicating that, I think, is a first point. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I guess Matthew's question there is that, you know, what is the best approach when wanting to engage a First Nations supplier? I know, and he said, and I'm quoting, I know that traditional procurement does not work. So do we, Karen, do you think traditional, like, do you think that it doesn't work? No, I think it does work. It definitely does work. We're the same as every other business. Mm -hmm. uh, you, Yeah, I, I don't see myself any different to all the other SNAP centres, only that I'm Indigenous, I'm proud of it. I want to service Indigenous people, but I also want them to use me and, you know, build up my business. But no, I don't think it's we're, we're any different at all there. And, and Karen, but that's very uh, how it does work, often these members that we have are already using Indigenous businesses. They just didn't know about it. And so I think that's part of changing the fixed mindset that some people have, you know. And I think, we I think there are probably, Matthew, I think there, I would argue that there are some opportunities that are just, like, so I have a business, Iscariot Media, so we just, we, on queue tenders every morning, the the, the list of tenders come out and you go, oh, well, uh, you know, and you go for the ones that you can go for. So they're just straight out, nothing changed. There's nothing in, like there's nothing different about them. But then occasionally there will be projects where there are specific, um, I guess, social targets that need to be met. And then you're actually involved in the work of supporting some businesses, some communities to then, upskill and do capacity building around making sure that they can deliver to those projects. So I think that there are there are some things where we have, okay, we need to work more closely and then some things are just standard. Joe, would you have, would you say that most of your work, I guess asking you the same question, I mean, you're on, you'd be looking at Q tenders every day, I guess, like the rest of us. Hold on, you're still on mute. Yeah, I think we like um, we we look at Q tenders um, you know regularly. Um, we also um, we own other systems too, like uh, you know other cleaning um, organisations where we uh, we get we get cleaning tenders that come out. And yeah, so we we constantly look in. We own our landscaping tenders too, so we constantly get landscaping tenders that come from you know, Fulton Hogan and, and CPB and, and John Holland, those clients too. So we, we constantly get that daily, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Matthew's just followed up. And thank you. Sorry, I don't want to feel like I'm picking on you, Matthew. But yes, so Matthew's just said, I've run RFQs and haven't got a response. 
I find it works better with word of mouth relationships and introductions totally, absolutely. And as a business owner, sometimes we get we get um, requests for quote and then you just have to go, I'm actually way too busy. I can't re respond. So sometimes as the business owner and it's frustrating for you because you've been set as the as the buyer, you've been set, hey, you need to use Indigenous businesses. Um, and the businesses are like, I can't, I cannot respond to this. I just have too much work on, or it's just not something that we're interested in, or price isn't right. Like there's a whole range of issues, but thank you so much. But I do agree with what you're saying there, Matthew. Word of mouth relationships and introductions do matter. I know that sometimes I've decided I'm not going for that job, then get a phone call and go, okay, I'll go for it. You know, so we're all what we're human, I think is probably the issue there. Um uh there's Karen there's a question there for you specifically um she um so this is from Amanda she's great story of improving the outcomes for your Indigenous employees have you had an opportunity to influence other SNAP franchisees to create a similar model with Indigenous traineeships <laughs> uh that's a tricky one but no I haven't but what I have suggested um you know there's a lot of different cultures in SNAP and I've suggested that they come on board and bring their culture into their centres. Yeah. Uh, I, I really feel people don't do that enough in business. Um, and, and that's kind of the only, uh, that's where I've gone with that. Um, I have amazing support from SNAP head office. Um, they're extremely proud of my centre. Um, I'm allowed to, you know, add my Indigenous touch to all my stationery and my shop and, um, yeah, so they're they're really on board with me. So yeah, fantastic, fantastic. And there's and you know and, and your I guess your industries it's not an easy industry to work in. I see you sometimes you're working the longest hours. So not every industry is oh I want to so want to do that. So just getting traineeships anybody is can be difficult, I imagine. Yeah, it's because it's production based. That's why it's you know it's long hours, and we are a small business. So you know everything that we've got to do everything in house. Um, yeah, and look, when I first started, I was doing sixty and seventy hours a week just trying to build the business up, get a client base. You know. Um, so now doing 30 hours a week or 40 hours a week is actually a bonus for me. Such a luxury. <laughs> yeah, it's a luxury. I remember walking the streets, you know, in the middle of December and just knocking on businesses' doors and saying, hey, I'm here, you know, this is what I can do for you. Um, and, and that was just my days and months. But now we've sort of, it's all more word of mouth now. Yeah. I have a client base that, you know, uh, a bunch of Indigenous businesses that support me that wouldn't go anywhere else. I yeah. do a lot of work for all the elders um, and the elders on in on Minjerabar as well. So yeah. I think it's this trust thing. Um, yeah. As you grow your business and you build it, you kind of don't have to work as hard. You just have yeah. to be yourself yeah. and let your client know that there's no way you're going to let them down. They know that and, yeah. That's, I think, the hardest thing is that's how you become successful. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we have another question here. Um, Joey, I might ask you this one. So are there ways that we can engage with communities and elders to better understand the needs of Aboriginal-owned businesses when responding to procurement opportunities? I've found that um, uh, is to actually get out and... and, and Get to know the community, the elders especially in that. Um, so, like we we work pretty closely with um, like Billy Iverson here um, in Southeast Queensland. Um, he's able to you know to help me out with the network within the community. We do a lot with um, Ipswich Jets um, uh, Rugby League Club out at um, Ipswich. There, uh, we sponsored the uh, under 18s and under 20s this year, and also the reconciliation round. Um, we also sponsored the, the um, Ipswich Jets netball team for their reconciliation um, uh, netball uh, week that they had. So, um, you know, they they had, they, you know, with netball players, they're a lot different to, to, to league players. Everything's um, sponsored for them, but we sponsored the, the, the uniforms for the week. So it's about giving back to the community. Um, 
you know, we had an opportunity to um, you know, give him back home to community back in Townsville. I sponsored an under-16 um, Townsville rugby league boys team to come down and they played in the QMC Carnival. You know, we gave them 10,000 bucks and you know, without that, they wouldn't be able to come down and you know, showcase their talents down here. So it's about you know, giving back to the community. I think it's very important. Excellent, thank you. Lucy, there's a question here for you. Um, thanks, Matthew. Um, so does Supply Nation vet their suppliers to certify they are genuine Indigenous businesses and not black cladding? So do you want to have a chat about black cladding? I would love to. And uh, obviously it's a, it's a common topic at the moment. Uh, I mean, basically the reason that Supply Nation exists is to prevent black cladding. So without any verification process in place, uh, you know, these mandated government procurement policies, you know, people can either deliberately take advantage of them, which isn't usually the case, but, you know, a, a, some, something that's common in that space is joint ventures, for example, which have a lifespan of about three years. So that uh, business could be taken over by the non-Indigenous owner, for example, or it could be sold. Uh, and unless there are checks and balances in place, you're relying on people to kind of self-notify that it's no longer Indigenous owned. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that it's really important to have verification so that black cladding doesn't exist. And if anyone has a concern about uh, an Indigenous supplier not being Indigenous, which comes up from time to time, they would just uh, report it to Supply Nation. Yeah. Uh, who would do an audit? Yeah, but and I know, and I know that from my experience, who are registered suppliers. Um, I don't know if it's annual, but it's pretty regular where you're. We have to go in every regularly and confirm that our everything is up to date. And if there's any shareholder changes, like you know, you're notified by ASIC to know that those things. Like a lot of that stuff is automated, but we're required to actually go in and you know, make sure that everything's above board again. And I do, and I think the issue too for, for the audience members is, is that there are lots of ways to get around things. And I don't think, I don't think the supply nation system is perfect, but I actually don't know that there's any other way to do it. Like, I think that the fact that you have a reporting ability, the ability to report someone, if you feel that something is not okay, and then it's investigated, I think that that's, pretty much what we have and yeah so as, but yeah I yeah it's a tricky one um so we did have a question for Karen but it's disappeared I think it maybe have been answered somewhere oh so can either Joey or um Karen what are some of the can you provide an example of challenges that you faced and how you've overcome them in relation to building capacity to meet the needs of a government contract so have you ever had you know, like got a government contract and went, uh-oh, something's going to go wrong here? And have you been able to go back to government and say, hey, I think we're going to come up with some capacity issues here. What can we do? I'll, I'll go. Um, yeah, you go. Are you going to come? No, no, you go, Joe. Um, I suppose the one that... that Pops out as the uh, Brisbane City Council, um, you know, last year when when uh, we were cleaning the community halls, and then COVID hit in March, April, and then they looked at social procurement businesses to look at uh, cleaning the buses because the bus drivers used to drive the buses, and then they wanted them to clean, and they yep. were part of the union. They said, "No, we ain't doing that." So we had opportunity to to look at three stations. So we had to get seventy staff in two days so that was a massive big challenge for us but we, we got oh. there and yeah so um to date we um have that contract um, probably two years on from last year so uh we have seven sites and we got over uh 75 cleaners that work full-time on those sites so that was a big challenge and uh yeah so yeah karen did you have an example yeah, I was just going to uh, mention the one time in my 10 years 
where I had a problem with a, a government contract. It was a federal con it was a federal government contract, um, and it was way too big for me. But you know, you start you're building your business and you're thinking, wow, this is just going to change everything. Um, so I had a contractor do the printing in Sydney, and um, I and and. I was very clear with that, that the contractor was going to be doing this, this job for me. It was too big, but we were going to be doing certain parts of the job mm -hmm. um, and, and they didn't fulfil the delivery side of things. So, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, so that was a real issue for me because I'd actually flown down to look at the job to make sure it was 100% before it was delivered to Canberra, but it wasn't. And um, I guess I over. I've learned from that, that um, don't take on jobs that are just too big and out of your reach. Yep. You know, um, we still do big jobs, but that was a massive job, you know. Um, so, so I've learned, I know our capabilities mm. and I stick to them. And that way you don't disappoint anyone. Yeah, and, and I imagine too, Karen, like your do job from Duncan that you stayed up all night doing, yes. sometimes the, the delivery dates are just like, oh. can I have this and I need it next week? And you're like, the, how do you deliver something so quickly? Like, And so yeah. sometimes it's the time frames that for a small business that's still in that growing phase, yeah. you just... You just sit there going, I know I could, this job would be really good if I had an extra two weeks to do it. Exactly. And I think you have to look at a job and say, no, this is out of my reach. As long as, you know, as much as we'd love the money and we can build the business, it's just out of our reach. So so I don't, you know, I mean, we, you know what we're like, Lisa, if someone says they want something mm -hmm. now, I'll pull a job off and put it on for them because I won't have anyone not have what they need um and like that we we do print through the night we do weird hours yeah. if there's a tight deadline but I think it is knowing your capabilities and yeah. and that's what I've learned from that one job um yeah so the the only way I can overcome that is don't take them when they're too big for me <laughs> Part of the work that we try to do with members is to try to get them to understand that Indigenous businesses are by and large SMEs and so they put together these tender contracts and a larger company might have a team of people working on the tender and huge yep. budget and if the Indigenous business invests the huge resources into the tender and then they don't get it, it can, you know, as though it's not worthwhile. So it's yeah. about getting them to understand that they need to make it easier, basically. Yeah. You know? and, and Chris, Chris in the comments there has just said, truly respect that honesty from my suppliers. I'd rather hear that at the outset and then and go elsewhere rather than overstretch and fail and no one wins. And I think that's absolutely right. And so if you're if you're engaging businesses that may be new, and I'm not saying don't engage business, like I'm trying not to to sort of put new businesses down because I'm not but yeah you do need to be really careful about um making sure that people are honest with you about what their capacity is and I've done it as well and I and I'm and I do apologize Karen for all those times I've said Karen can you print this by tomorrow please <laughs> now there was a question before it's disappeared now about um ownership I think it was from someone uh in New Zealand and in Australia um we do have there's for if we're going by the supply nation definitions registered businesses are those that are 50 50 uh, 50 50 percent owned um a minimum i should say and uh certified suppliers are 51 percent 51 49 so there's just the two distinctions fundamentally there's not a lot of difference between what a registered versus what a certified person gets so it's kind of okay i guess in the reality i think that um it, it probably doesn't it's not it, like 50 50 is fine um i've got another question here i can imagine diversification played a big part for businesses during covid so what do you think so are there any learn this is from glenda um karen and um joey did like joey you mentioned before that you started doing buses as a result of covid um what do you think you've learned out of diversifying um your services I think with you know, when we when we 
when we'd done the buses and that, um, you know, we had to, you know, there was a lot of people that were nervous about COVID at that time. So, yeah. um, you know, because it was public transport they were using. So, um, you know, we had to get a product out of Melbourne that was uh, TGA approved um, by the federal mm -hmm. government to use on, on, that, on that project. And at the same time, um, we were on the Cross River Rail, uh, which is uh, uh, the, um, the rail project again in Brisbane. So we do all the commercial clean on that project too. So, um, you know, we learned that, you know, that the, the cleaning never stopped. It actually ramped up the other way. So you do your normal cleans, plus you know, there was COVID clean on top of that. So you know, that was big lessons that we learned that, you know, um, that, uh, and we, yeah, so our, our business skyrocketed with, with, with cleaning uh, um, over the last 12 to 18 months. Yeah. yeah. And it's quite intense as well. Karen, do you, do you feel, are you kind of, you've stuck to your pretty much what you do, I think? But you haven't yeah. really diversified post COVID? No, not we, you know, we already print everything we possibly can. Yeah. Um, we expanded that by bringing in a shirt machine so we could do shirts in houses and yeah. in house and hats and things like that, merchandise in house. Um, we just made our, we just included more products, you know, but the, no one was really spending money through COVID and especially not on printing, you know, unless it was necessary, like medical yeah. things and things like yeah. that. Yeah. So. yeah. 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 Karen, I just want to ask you a question. Sometimes I hear stories um, when a business has been running for a long time and then I think that's my my computer is making noises. I apologise for that. Um, the When we have um, businesses that are suddenly, you know, go and get supply nation registration and certification, suddenly they're not getting Indigenous, they only get Indigenous work from there on in. They're not necessarily just getting, like, for you, Karen, I just want to print your stuff. I don't have to only have to print your Indigenous stuff. Do you feel yeah. like that's been an experience for you? It has been, yes. Yeah. But uh, so so first of all, we, uh, I'd like to clear it up as well, where we are registered, but not because um, we're 50% uh, where I'm 100%. It's, I own the business. It's 100% Indigenous. But Supply Nation doesn't certify franchises because mm -hmm. I'm uh, under a larger umbrella. So that's that's been a bit of an issue for me over the last... I, I fought about it. Had I, I fought for it for about three or four years and then gave up on it. So, um, but, yeah, so that's the first thing. Um, and, yeah, definitely. So... Okay, so you've got a big company that says, I want to come on board and I want to support you guys. Um, I've got this, I'll, I want you to print my wrap, my reconciliation wrap, which is fantastic. Um, and then I want you to do my reconciliation postcards to go with that. But we don't get any of the non-Indigenous work from them. So I have to sort of, you know, once we build relationships and they become more of a friend than a client, I can put a little thing in there. You know, we do print work that's not Indigenous as well. Um, we do do standard business cards. We do do NCR, all these sort of things. So, But by that time, we've grown a relationship where, you know, a lot of my clients become friends, you know, and they'll yeah. just call in the centre and sit down and have a yarn and, yeah, so it does happen. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and, and yeah, we, we, yeah, but that kind of story. It'd be interesting, I guess, for your from your perspective, Lucy, to maybe document some of those things to make sure that uh, just because you're an Indigenous business doesn't mean you can't just print whatever. Like you can do every every any type of clients, just not the Indigenous specific jobs. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think there's a question in the chat about registration and certified suppliers. As Lisa noted, they are equally Indigenous suppliers. Uh, and in fact, a lot of our registered suppliers could be certified, but they've just not chosen not to go through that slightly more intensive verification process. But they're both valid Indigenous businesses. So. Yeah, it's just about the time, taking the time to fill in the forms. And it's on the to-do list, but it's just pretty low down because registration is fine. Um, 
I'm, I'm taking notes because I'm really interested. We've got 10 more minutes. Uh, well, probably eight more minutes because then we'll wrap up. But I'm thinking about some of the key issues that I'm seeing in the chat. And the first one that I'm seeing is message to Indigenous businesses, which is what I'm interested in. Our message to Indigenous businesses would be, if an RFQ comes out, please respond even if you're not going to take up the opportunity. And I think as a small business myself, out because we get lots of RFQs, um, just taking 10 minutes or five minutes, actually, even just going, thank you so much for your uh, uh, request for quote. But unfortunately, at this time, we're unable to take it, you know, maybe in a few months, that kind of thing. So just training our businesses to make sure that we respond, even if we're not able to, uh, even if we're not going to take up the opportunity. So that's a good one. And the second, the second thing that I'm hearing from the questions is about is procurement different for Indigenous businesses? So I feel like we've kind of addressed that question, but I'm actually interested and I think that that's a key question that folks are having is do I have to do something differently? And I think my response is, is sometimes like it depends on the industry. There is not, I always say there are Indigenous businesses in every industry, but they may not necessarily be where you live. They may be up north and they, and it's about understanding the capacity of, we've got a very large country and we can't all be everywhere. Um, I do remember going to a Supply Nation a training event and they, they were trying to help businesses. If you're a caterer in Kununurra, in the top end of WA, make sure you don't click the button that says I can service all of Australia. Those sorts of little things I think we need, and that's just a very kind of, you know, extreme example, but making sure that we are really clear about what we can deliver and where we can deliver it. Um, so uh, we've got one question here about breaking up big jobs. Um, so in terms of big jobs, I often consult to public agencies on how they should design their RFQs and RFPs. Awesome. When there's a big job, I recommend they allow suppliers to bid for parts of a job so that smaller companies can actually tender. Joey, I imagine that you've been given an opportunity to tender for some very large jobs or smaller chunks within large contracts. Yeah, probably. Um, I remember early in the piece when we first because uh, landscaping is now a big arm of business. When we started to tender for work for like schools and hospitals being built, we only could do the soft. So soft means just laying turf. We couldn't do yeah. the hard, which is just civil and concrete. So they weren't prepared to, to, to cut up those packages. So we had to, to look at how we could get opportunities. So we had to then therefore deliver the soft and hard packages and then you know, a twenty thousand dollar job turned into a fifty thousand, then a hundred thousand, and then you know we started to to work our way up. And you know now we you know we we're doing three million dollar jobs with you know big tier one companies on a on a main road project, but that took four years of yeah. chipping away and chipping away and chipping away. And so it's about you know getting those small little opportunities and then converting it, doing a good job, you know, and then yeah, and then and having uh, you know. You know, good good projects behind and, and cleaning is another one now where I've found where a lot of um, you know companies that have reconciliation action plan and supply nation members is that when they go for cleaning contracts they go out to national companies and those national companies you know they get them out of Sydney or Melbourne so you know yeah. so for example um, Woolworths is a is a good one where you know they they've come out to a tender for. Um, uh, cleaning or two uh, nationally to clean their trucks and trailers. So they're looking at local suppliers from Queensland, which is really good yeah. rather than a national company out of Sydney or Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fantastic. And it's such an important part, as you say, Joe, of capability building and giving smaller, smaller Indigenous businesses access to these large contracts that they would otherwise be shut out of, um, which I think is really important. Yeah, and there's a lot of conversation, particularly in Queensland. I know that not everybody um, is from Queensland um, in this call, in this webinar today, but in Queensland, the topic of the year, of the day, of course, is 2032. So everybody is talking about the Olympics. And I think that um, one of the things, we've got a decade, well, actually less than a decade, because things have to get built before then. But we are really talking about, and one of the things that I say to our businesses is it's stepping stones. You actually can't, you can't be this big at the outset. You actually have to step 
in and start getting those. Um, start with a small job, be tier five, but have a goal in, in three years to be tier four or tier three. Like making sure that people understand that it is a stepping stone. Because I do think that sometimes business is like, oh, I want to get into business, but not understanding that it does take years and years of work. Um, awesome. So I think so. I think I've answered that one. I think the other question here, and this is more about how do we promote our businesses. So what can assist Indigenous businesses to get their profiles known across government agencies for the types of goods and services they use? And I think the first thing is you need to be registered or certified on Supply Nation. That would be the very first thing that I would suggest. Karen, what else do you think? What has made you, got you known? You've said a lot of word of mouth. How did Duncan yeah. find you? <laughs> <laughs> I was at a networking event. So, so I think Black Business Finder as well is really important yep. in Queensland um, or the QIP, whatever that's called, calling itself now. Um, I Look, Lisa, I really just went out myself and met people mm. and every time there was a networking function on for the Queensland government, I was there, yep. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and look, you know, that's how we got to meet, you and I, being yes, at yeah. both working hard, building our businesses by going to those networking functions. And and I think with Indigenous business, we all look out for each other. We all support each other. And that's so important, I think. And if you can, with the government, they're really, you've got to build your trust with them. You start yeah. small. That's what happened with me. I started small and I didn't let them down and I never have left, let them down, you know, since I started working for them. Um, and, and I think that's that's it, building, giving, building their trust. Yeah. yeah and yeah. just you know, get, get yourself out there, you know. Do everything you can to meet your local community. Um, you know, I've got every elder in Underwood that comes to, to visit <laughs> in Logan that comes to order work from me because they know that I'll take care of them. Yeah. And I think that that's all you can do, market yeah. yourself. Yeah. Joey, mm. what, do, you, do you have any thoughts? We've got two minutes, um, one minute. One minute, yeah. 99% well, of all our contracts are relationship. That's the key. Yeah. And um, yeah. people buy from people. They don't buy from capability statements or sent out. You actually got to get out and meet people and share your stories and how you started, you know, where you are now and what it took you to get there. So I think it's a, it's a, you have to be a people's person and you have to really, yeah. you know, market it and get out there. Yep. Awesome. Now, Steph, I hope we've answered your question kind of in a roundabout way. Is the traditional procurement process a barrier to Indigenous businesses responding to opportunities? And if so, what would improve it? I think it's a combination of um, recognising that they're crazy busy, um, building those relationships, I think is really is, is one of the things that we're hearing today. And Sometimes it's just a procurement job. You just go for it. It doesn't matter if you're black or white. You just go for the job. And then there are some jobs that are actually have other targets and that we need to, to kind of address. Now, I do want to say to Jesse and Jesse, both Jessies, thank you so much for your feedback in the chat. I'm really interested in making, um, kind of pushing the message out to the folks that I work with, making sure that, and, and in my own business, making sure that we respond to opportunities, even if we can't take them. And noting that sometimes in responding, it turns out that they can actually tweak the tweak the job a bit and you may get the job. So thank you so much for reminding um, us about that one. That's really awesome. Thank you everybody for our questions. We have two more minutes. I'm gonna do a final 30 seconds for each of our panelists. What's 30 second thing, one 30 second message you would give to everybody. Karen, you're off mute, so you get to go first. Oh, uh, message. Um, I, I firmly agree with responding to everybody that asks for a quote, even if you can't do it. Um, and if someone, there's not an email that comes in that I don't respond with, thank you, you'll receive something soon. Um, yeah. Or, you know, I immediately respond to the client because all they're, they're interested in is that you're important to them and you have to make them the most important. Fantastic. Lucy, 30 seconds. One last message to this awesome community. Hold on, hold on. There we go. One last message. Uh, thank you for everyone for having me on the call. Uh, if you are in another country, 
don't be afraid to log on to Supply Nation and find an Australian Indigenous supplier, because as you can see from today, they are fantastic. Uh, but thanks for having me on. Fantastic. Joey, 30 seconds. One last okay. message to this amazing community. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity today. Um, mine is, if you work hard, good luck will find you. That's, that's mm. my motto there. Fantastic. Awesome. That's it. We've done It's Indigenous Business Month this year. We'll see you again for the 8th Indigenous Business Month next year. But, of course, you can buy from Indigenous businesses any month, of the, any, any month of the year. So thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.